I don't know him, but I have heard many good things about him before. Um, and you all saw the information that was on the um, Envision events page. I just want to reiterate a couple things that are on there, which is he was recognized in the best lawyers in America from since 2005 and was selected as the lawyer of the year for employment law management in 2013 and 2015 and lawyer of the year for labor law management in 2013 and has been listed in Wisconsin super lawyers. Um, and is, what does AB preeminent mean? I don't know, peer review rated. Yeah, that's Martindale Hubble, which means how we're rated within um, nationally. And to, that's a nice rating. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so we have quite the expert here talking to us about employment, about HR law. So welcome, please welcome Jim, mm -hmm. Jim Macy, and uh, he's gonna give us his expertise. Thanks a lot. Good to be here this morning. I came all the way. I had to get up pretty early this morning because I came all the way from the town of Black Wolf. And if you know where that is, it's just north of Wentz, uh, Highway 45. So it's great. It's really a local discussion today. I do get to go to all kinds of places, but uh, this is really nice because I'll be home and I'll be local this morning. I'm an employment lawyer. I came up with the Fox family. I worked in Madison and Milwaukee first a little bit for Milwaukee Law Firm. I've always worked for Milwaukee Law Firm. I still work for a Milwaukee law firm, but I've been here in the Fox Valley since 1982, just doing employment law and just working with companies doing employment law. So uh, the name of the firm I'm with now is called Von Breeson and Roper. If you're heading north on Highway 41 and you go by the old Plexus building, you're gonna see Von Breeson at the top and you go, who the heck is that? That's us. So uh, we've consolidated Appleton and Nina and Oshkosh offices up there within the last week actually. And, that's who we are. In terms of other sort of local things and working on those, when Ashgash Corporation was negotiating its contract with the UAW, uh, before it had the contracts from Texas and the big military vehicles, I did the collective bargaining for them a couple times. So one time and then the next five years later, right before the economics of that, for those of you that do collective bargaining, it was really interesting because you got to put the economics together, right? Get your health care right and everything else to be able to make those bids. And fortunately, we were able to do that. Ashkash truck at the time was able to do that. And here we are today, thousands of people later and a pretty big impact for all of us across the state. Well, Mercury had a little bit of an issue uh, a couple of years ago, minor kind of thing in the area here. There was some union issues with that. And I was a little bit involved in the background of that as to what do you do with the vote? What don't you do with the vote? And some of those kind of things. If you're watching some of the stuff more locally, something a little bit different, but it's employment related, is police officer in Wauwatosa, who's had three shootings that resulted in deaths. What do you do with a police officer and how do you put that person back on the street when you've got rioting, you've got issues with Mayfair Mall, all the aspects of that. So the other day I was down there and we're working right in the middle of that scenario. Um, it's fun, it's challenging, and as you know, you never know when the phone rings what you're going to be working on for that particular day. Can I say in the different years, has there ever been a year like 2020? Absolutely, positively, there's never been a year like this that I can remember in employment law and the other aspects. Most of the folks like you that I work with say, could we just take this year off the calendar and start <laughs> again? But at the, at the other end of the day, it's Bring on the challenge. Let's take it. Let's look at this five years from now and say, here's the decisions we made. And we made tough decisions based on the information that we had and based on, on the resources that were available. And we did the best we could under really an unknown disease, an unknown science. We're not going to know whether we're right for a number of years till we look back on it. So the best you do is you put, you follow the law, you put the best protocols in place. We got to run our businesses and move forward with those. Bring on the challenge. And that's what I'm hearing across the state from folks like you is bring on the challenge. Who better than us and working with HR to help get the economy going, keep our people safe, keep the recruitment, the retention we've all been working so hard on for years to do, and we'll do that. I'm not going to spend the day talking about COVID because you're probably sick of talking about COVID. I'll answer any questions that you have as we're going through the program today. Just interrupt me. Feel free to do that. What I thought would be helpful is to take a look at the kind of legal issues that we're seeing 
from our clients and our folks across the state and of course across the country because the companies have facilities in different states, things like that, and sort of fill you in. And I, I try to look for things that might not be on the usual kind of stuff that you get that comes across the wire. So if it seems a little different, it's by design to try to give you some updates for you as professionals in this business to say, here the antenna's up, here's something I should look out for and be aware of, okay? So with that, um, we're gonna go through a PowerPoint. We can make this available to you, but we're gonna talk about some of the areas in discrimination law in terms of what's going on with that, what are some new areas that you may wanna think about. You know that Wisconsin's got a broad, a long, positive history of protected employment categories and things like that. And we're proud of it. Quite frankly, we're ahead. People that know that we're employment alerts from Wisconsin and we're at national conferences, hey, we want to talk to you because we want to know what's going on in Wisconsin, the first state to have unemployment, the first state to have workers' comp, those kind of things. Probably the broadest history out there, all California has given us a run, but the broad, biggest history of protected categories and things like that. That's okay. We're proud of that history. And we're used to dealing with a lot of these things. But as I listed in some of the categories, use of lawful products, sexual orientation, arrest and conviction record. Sexual orientation, arrest and conviction are unique to Wisconsin. If you get an ERD case, notice it's not cross, com, uh, cross complaint. If you get an age case, it's filed with the EEOC federal side and it's filed with the ERD state side, right? Not some of these others because it's only a state law, at least it was, okay? So what's new in regards to some of those kind of things? Very recently, as you know, the U.S. Supreme Court had the Bostick case. The Bostick case had to do with really three cases from different parts of the country. All three of the cases dealt with a fact scenario of a person that was um, gay or is a sexual preference kind of issue. And then one, for example, had played on a gay softball team and was fired because the didn't, company didn't think that was representative of their company to have somebody gay playing on a gay softball team. Something we don't really consider Wisconsin because we've dealt with sexual preference as a discriminatory category forever. So it's not a big deal. What's interesting in that case is how does the Supreme Court get to the position to say, we're going to interpret sex discrimination standing alone to be encompassing to include sexual orientation, and that's what the decision did. This had been back and forth in the courts for a long time. For those of us that followed it, that kind of stuff, it was kind of interesting because Congress had put in a number of bills to change the law to add sexual orientation as a protected category, and it, it didn't pass. Usually an interpretation of laws, they'll look to the legislative history and say, well, if they tried to get it and they didn't get it, it must not be in the law. So then you go, well, how did the Supreme Court get there if Congress couldn't get there? Well, that's not necessarily new in our history, <laughs> that sometimes the Supreme Court comes in and legislates. I hate to say that, but <laughs> well, there's another principle in interpretation that says that the law is so clear, just on its face, that it's so clear, we don't look at legislative history. So that's how at least the majority of the court, wasn't unanimous, but a majority of the court, including some of the conservative judges, I'm not making a political statement, just sort of an interesting background of the case, decided it was so clear on the space that that ought to include that, that we will step aside from the history and any of the others and we're going to include that in the category. Okay, that's what happened in the case and that, that's how that turned out. So that now is a protected category under federal law under sex discrimination. And you say, who cares? We're in Wisconsin, we're already covered. As I said before, that was not a case that was cross-filed before, before EEOC and the ERD. Just the ERD would handle those cases, okay? Now they're gonna be cross-filed, which means it could be an EEOC case for you, it could be an ERD case for you. It could be that the ERD investigates and they find probable cause and it goes to an administrative law judge. At the same time, it could be the right to sue letter under the EEOC, and as you know, that process is different. That goes to federal court. So you need to keep an eye on that as a practitioner to go, what forum am I in? What's going on with this? And the leverage you get that comes to us from a federal court versus an ERD matter, the remedies, the other stuff are different. So it does add another category now that does impact us. We've got to keep an eye on as to 
which area is that, which route is that going to go, and, and, and how do we deal with that? It doesn't mean you practice different. Again, realistically in Wisconsin, we don't see a ton of these cases, but you might see a little bit of an uptick. uptick. We have not as of yet in that regard. Okay. Let me talk about a different one, and this is state arrest and conviction. Again, this is not the federal law. I don't know of any cases where the courts, federal courts, are looking to expand the law in this area, so I think it'll stay a state law kind of issue. But in, in Millwork had a case in there, Herbshot case here, and it had to do with an individual that had a little bit of a criminal and as you know, when you do your background checks, you gotta go, okay, we got an issue here, can we hire? Does it substantially relate to the position that the person applied for, right, under the law? Well, in this case, the, they were working with a placement organization, as I know a number of you do. And there was com communication between the placement service and the applicant. And the placement service said, unfortunately, given your record on CCAP, and uh, the hiring manager at this particular company, which was Millwork, will not consider someone with your type of record. End of story, person wasn't hired, person files a case against Millwork saying, you just made a decision based on that and I don't think that's fair at all, right? That's the typical kind of case that we're gonna get under arrest and conviction. So when I said he had a little bit of a record, let's go to the next sheet on that. And this is somebody who had been convicted of two counts of disorderly, conduct and uh, worthless checks, criminal trespass, um, operating while intoxicated three times and did a little bit of jail time for that. Now I'm seeing that as HR people, you might start getting nervous as you're kind of going through this record. All right, how's this gonna impact your workplace? Uh, and then we had the sexual assault of a child in 98 and 10 years in jail. So recently out of jail, applying for a position with your company, let's just say for the sake of discussion. Do you hire the person? Don't you hire the person? What do you do in a situation like that? And as you know, prohibits, based on arrest and conviction, this is an arrest, this is absolutely convictions, can it be no, and is that discrimination, okay? So what happens in this particular case? Bottom line is the placement service and I want you to evaluate your use of placement services, and I think it's positive that you do just evaluate what your situation is with your placement service, because that's what mattered with Millwork, okay? The placement service in this particular scenario was a referral service. They weren't the, quote, hiring agent. Agent's the key word in this. How much authority do you give your placement service to do the interviews, make commitments on behalf of your company. They didn't give the placement service any directive at all. Remember that thing I showed you earlier with the response of what they said? Well, Millwork didn't say that to the placement agency. There was no communication or anything to say, if they got this kind of record, don't send them to us. There was nothing like that. Quite frankly, Millwork had a number of people that worked for them with criminal convictions and it wasn't an issue as far as that goes. Millwork used a number of different agencies, so it wasn't just one exclusive agency. Three or four agencies could refer people. Millwork would interview them separately, and then Millwork would make the decision as to whether or hire or not. Difference between a referral agency and an agent that could bind you and make an offer to people. Evaluate what your situation is. Evaluate what the contract you have with these people are, because it really matters in these kind of cases. Millwork didn't even know who Upshot was. Never even heard of Upshot until they received the complaint in the case. Imagine that day that you come into work and like I say, you never know what kind of day you're gonna get there. You get there and it changes by the hour. Here you get a complaint and you go, who the heck is this? We don't know anything about this. And that's what happened to them. Uh, there was simply a fee arrangement between Millwork and the agency. If they did take somebody from the referral agents and they stayed on board for X amount of time, then they paid the agent X amount of money. Some of you have that arrangement, some not. That arrangement matters. So what the Equal Rights Division did after a full hearing of the case really said the burden was on the complainant to demonstrate that there was an 
an agency relationship and the complainant wasn't able to do it. Quite frankly, there wasn't an agency relationship. But then judge pushed us a little further in this case to just sort of say, what were you thinking? Was there anything that you reasonably could have anticipated that they really were the agent in this case? That's a little scary because quite frankly, you got to kind of go out of your way to make it very clear that, that they're not your agent. So I say back to the documents, back to the discussions you have and things like that, all right? So what started as a conviction case really was a dual employer case, really was an agency kind of case, and really the burdens. Fortunately, at least for the placement service, Upshot never sued the placement service. The 300 days had run from the time that the complaint was filed or that email went out to the time the case was actually decided. Millwork was dismissed because they did nothing wrong. They didn't know about it. It wasn't an agency case. All of that is one of the latest you can see from the data in this case about arrest and conviction in Wisconsin agency case law. It's one you're not going to see regularly reported, but I thought you might find it interesting and up to date on the kind of things that you do with that. All separate and distinct from did it notice what I didn't analyze at all in this case, and I didn't when I tried this case, is whether it was substantially related or not. We never got to that issue because we had all the others first as to whether millwork should have been involved in the first place. But that's the biggest case lately from the ERD on this kind of stuff. Okay. So let's let's change gears a little bit and go into a different area. And this has to do with what's going on. It sort of disappeared a little bit behind the COVID discussions and things, but I gotta tell you, it's still out there a lot. What's going on with CBD? What's going on with marijuana? And every state around us is passing some kind of law that's either medically related or recreationally related to marijuana. Okay, so I thought I'd spend a little minute or two based on that. And then also with the anticipation that it's not going to go away from legislation in Wisconsin. Is the state legislature ready for that? Maybe not yet. Is the governor? Clearly, the governor is all on board. The governor, incidentally, if you didn't know this, used to be the school superintendent at Oldfield on the road from here. Okay? He's familiar with our area. He's familiar with a lot of these kind of things. And he would say from a medical standpoint, he's all for that. You also know, why would some of the conservative states or some of the conservative legislatures look to this? It's unbelievably huge tax money involved in this, okay? The reality of that is where a lot of this is getting pushed and is it spreading in, in, in growth. And this chart sort of shows you that you can see from the colors of it, there's a lot of states. And if you look at us, we're kind of there in the middle of God bless Iowa, but when Iowa falls, it's us, right? And then everybody around us. So who has had the, you don't have to raise your hand, but we certainly had the case where somebody comes back on Monday and they had gone camping for the weekend out of state, okay? So then you have the uh, either the CDL test or the other kind of test and somebody comes in positive and you've got a positive drug test because of the recreational use of some legal state. Do you have a legal <coughs> products case? What is your response to that? Are they impacted at work and how do you deal with all of those because clearly those cases are coming they're going on now we've got all of those kind of things in play a couple of cautions about that every state is a little bit different and i'm also talking about if you get this in your facilities that are in a state that like colorado you know any of the states that that use illinois we have lots of facilities in illinois and we'll have those kind of issues. Really, we have a chart of every state and every law. Every state law is a little bit different. There, there's no uniformity to that. So I put a list of the different kind of things we look at under these kind of laws as we're looking at where did this occur, which state applies, because it matters as to how you address it. How I address it in Colorado is different than how I address it in Illinois. And it's different than other states. So. Am I talking about medical? Am I talking about recreational? Am I talking about C CBD, which isn't really regulated as far as that goes? Just so you know, that's supposed to be under a percentage or zero THC in it to be able to be called a CBD or hemp versus THC marijuana. 
it, it, it shouldn't even register in a test, but there are some of those that it can occur. So look to the impact within the employment setting, all right? For example, is somebody under the influence? You know that when you test, it just tells you whether it's positive or not. If I'm testing for alcohol, I know it's in the system and it may impact and I can tell things a little bit different than marijuana that might have been used quite a while ago and is still in the system and may have no impact. What does that mean? What that means is your supervisors have to have the checklist and be trained as to analyzing the objective symptoms to make a distinction between, we may somebody know somebody tested positive, but you gotta go to the next step of, is it impacting work? Okay, so that's another analysis supervisors ought to do to determine is there an impact at work. It's still illegal under federal law. I'd say, well, if it's still illegal under federal law, we have a test that says if you are involved in illegal activity, we can terminate you. Well, can you? Is that arrest and conviction that does not substantially relate? And I'm back to that category in Wisconsin. Be careful with that. I can tell you there's two cases in other parts of the country that say even with the federal law, it's not a violation under with the state law and the conflict between the state and federal law because of the application of that law under commercial driver's license or other aspects under the facts that were presented in those cases. Be careful, I'm saying that it's not, not a given in the courts. That simply a positive test means a termination because federal law makes it illegal, okay? It's definitely not a given. This is all shifting from where we were a number of years ago as this goes across the country. So a little update on some of the aspects of that. Wisconsin, aside from arrest and conviction, still has the use of lawful products. And down in E, you're going to know it still says that one of the exceptions to the use of legal products. I used to leave it was legal in Colorado when I used it. Well, that may be, but if it impacts you here, again, back to the impact, and was a violation of federal law. Got a problem. For those of you that are federal contractors, obviously we got different standards. For those of you that have commercial driver's license people with different standards and testing aspects, so there's different things that come into play with those scenarios. Just an update on some of the stuff we're seeing, just kind of the thing to stay up on because it's not going away, it's growing as far as that goes. And, and if you haven't had these cases, that's great. When you get them, Maybe your antennas up a little bit on some of these kind of resources to kind of think about and look at, you know, as you're analyzing what to do under the circumstance. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to switch to a whole different area now. National Labor Relations Board. And you may say, we're not covered, we're too small. You may say, it's not that we've been in here, we're in the public sector, we're not covered by the National Labor Relations Board. But the National Labor Relations Board <laughs> which is the federal agency, it's kind of like the equivalent of the Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission. NLRB regulates employment type stuff and particularly things related to collective bargaining. Put that aside. They also regulate the conduct that has to do with protecting employees concerted protected activity. Section seven, seven right, okay? My right to organize or not organize. My right to engage in discussions of concerns in the workplace about my wages, conditions, hours and conditions of employment, okay? So it is regulated by the NLRB whether we're organized union setting or not, okay? Let me give you a bizarre case now, you know, but Jimmy John's a number of years ago had a case where the workers were upset with Jimmy John's and put up signs to say, if you eat our sandwiches, you're gonna get sick. Now, if I'm the employer, I'm a little concerned about that kind of decision. And they did some discipline in regards to that. And it became a Section 7 case. And I'm paraphrasing and cutting through a lot of the facts. And they found against the company for taking action against employees that said something that derogative about who the heck's going to eat their sandwiches if our employees are putting out that message. Well, the rest of the facts were they were engaged in trying to form a union. And the way that the company approached it and the way the National Labor Relations Board reviewed the messaging is that it may, but you gotta ask more questions to determine what would happen based on the safety protocols in place in the com company that it was a section seven violation when they're trying to form a union versus not. 
And you, you may recall, if you think back a couple of years ago, remember the, the big booklet that came out from guidance from the NLRB that said, relook, relook at everything in your handbook because basically you can't have any policies that don't violate the law. Maybe I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it seemed like everything you wrote in your policy was some violation of section seven, right? The board, of course this happens both state and federal, depending on who's in power in Washington, swings back and forth. Well, that NLRB case law at the time had really swung way over, and most of you rewrote a lot of your handbooks and policies in regards to because of the case law within it, or at least you advised to sort of take a look at those kind of things. And you also had a phrase in that that certainly said, and nothing in here is intended to violate anybody's section so I'm right to uh, engage in protective concert activity, right? Well, let's talk about some of the stuff that's going now, on now in the NLRB. And I'm talking about a case here, General Motors case, is July 21st, 2020. Try to get this stuff pretty current for you, but here's what's going on with this. The current NLRB is reevaluating that whole aspect of stuff and cases they were doing before. And they have overturned some of this case law very recently about when an employee is bad mouthing the company. And to what degree you can an employee bad mouth the company and not get disciplined? As I said before, it's pretty hard to do. In this particular case, under the facts, now General Motors is pretty big. And quite frankly, Oshkosh Corp, we had some of this too, where there's some of the union people actually have a job in-house paid on company payroll that pretty much spend full-time as union stewards union vote. That's okay. That's, there's nothing illegal about that. Well, this was one of these guys at General Motors. So as of April 11th, he gets in a heated exchange with his manager, uses the F word because he didn't like the, the cross training, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And he gets three days off. A couple weeks later, they get into another uh, argument and he doesn't like the supervisor, so he he, he mimes and, and mockingly acts as a slave and yes, master, no master, that kind of stuff. And, and he gets a little bit more time off for the insubordinate way that we handle that. October 6th, we get a little further down the road and you can see the facts with that and it plays loud music, just disruptive, profane, racially charged language. Uh, other crap, and he gets 30 days off. So that was the background of the case. Uh, and again, he's pretty much a full time union steward in meetings to discuss issues related between the company and the union. Under the prior test, and if we go to the next, I put together the, the different tests, and, and the NLRB changed its analysis and its tests now. Before it was the Atlantic test and that was the tougher one for you as an employer that it was let's look at where the discussion occurred what was the subject matter what was the nature of the employees comments and outburst and was it in any way provoked by the employer's reaction to it I don't know too many of the employees that say that it well they weren't provoked by the way the company was acting and so that wasn't really that tough standard to meet and also probably wasn't fair and that's why a lot of those cases you go how could that be that they could just be that rude and insubordinate to our managers that's why the test wasn't that tough well the nlrb went back to the right line test that was the test that existed before so the new test general motors is really the old test right line and it has this analysis under it that's a little bit more fair notice that it it doesn't just talk about a test, but it says it's going to be the employee's burden to prove these things before there's a violation. And did they engage in protected activity or not? I can tell you, I'm looking at little cases well before right line. They look at well, what did they do? What was the context of this? And there is a line that if they cross, it, it's inappropriate. So, and again, as that test is laid out up there, it's a little more common sense as this board applied it in that regard. It's not a given that anybody can just say anything they want and tee off at our supervisors and other kind of things. Do we warn them? Do you progressively discipline all of that? Of course, nothing changes with that. Common sense really does rule the day with that. And you know you gotta kind of hold back supervisors once in a while. 
years ago, we had a scenario going on, a union steward throws a soda can out on the front lawn. Fire them, we're firing them. No, we're not gonna fight somebody for that. A little bit of common sense, and I, I know you have these meetings of supervisors in HR, you gotta kinda hold them back and go, take 10 steps back, take a deep breath, let's put some common sense to that. There's a little support for you if you work through that and what those tests might be, okay? It's not just the General Motors case recently, but other cases too that are starting to come out of the NLRB now that are going a different direction. Another one had to do with moonlighting. It was another area that they were pretty strict about, about your ability to maybe limit some secondary employment if we were con use common sense and practical about impact on our company. And here, the NLRB overturned an ALJ, uh, administrative law judge, found against the employer that had a policy that prohibited moonlighting. And the way the judge had looked at it is, and if you're familiar with salting cases, it's where a union rep actually comes in and applies for a, a job. You don't hire him because he, I don't know if any of you have these, but the application all over it. I'm a union rep. I'm going to organize your company. Oh my God. We don't want that. By design, if you haven't seen these, they're great. They're really fun. Uh, the applications by design go out of their way to raise all those flags. Hopefully, you don't hire and then an automatic charge because you didn't hire because union position, probably. That's salting. And the judge said, well, you know, the way this policy is, that could prohibit salting, and salting is legal. So um, I'm not going to allow that. You know, he goes, well, you know, you can't make a decision based on what you think it might be or presumption. We got to go a little bit more than that and put some common sense back into it. It's another case here that's starting going back the other way. I was referring earlier to the, one of the Boeing decisions back in 2017. Remember when March and February weren't that long ago? <laughs> we started stuff oh, I go all the way back in 2017. That was the start of this kind of stuff that things that might be construed as a violation of the law under the old board, the new board has gone, uh-uh, that's not going to be a good enough burden anymore. Companies got to be able to have some common sense. There's got to be a burden to show they actually did something wrong. Okay. And so that's where this stuff is kind of heading back. As that pendulum is definitely swinging back. So you have, if you haven't seen these, you now have some of the most latest, greatest cases in that regard as to what's going on with those kind of things. Okay. Any questions about any of those kind of pieces with any of that from the NLRB? There. Okay. Well, I said I wouldn't talk much about COVID, but it's pretty hard not to talk about COVID. I didn't get to this meeting without getting on the phone and talking to a company about issues under COVID. I will leave this meeting and talk to a couple of people driving back through the town of Black Wolf up to Nina about COVID. And then I know I have scheduled meetings all day the rest of the day. And I know we'll be talking about so what are the biggest things, I'm curious, what's some of the biggest things that, that you're seeing about COVID? Certainly a huge discussion going on now about schools reopening or not reopening and the impact that it has on all of your businesses. I can tell you that, and again, I'm not, and I don't mean to in any of the things that I'm saying today, and I really mean that. I, political statements in that regard. And I'll try to be as factually as to what's happening and why or whatever, whatever it is it is. I, in looking at the school districts, there are a, a group of school districts, normally the smaller to the mid-sized schools that are more apt to want to reopen with face-to-face -face kids in the classroom. More often than not, within the communities in Wisconsin, those size communities and school districts, a lot of these districts, all school, almost all school districts, did surveys of parents and surveys of their staff. What do you want? A high percentage of 60 to 70 percent said, we'd like to be in school. We'd like to have the kids back. And quite frankly, a high percentage of the staff was the same way. You're not going to necessarily hear that, but that's what the surveys were saying. Politically, that isn't sitting well. And again, I, 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 
politically is only because of the statements being put out by the teachers association and when i say this i don't mean teachers okay i'm not here to bad on teachers <laughs> told you what their surveys are saying their association is saying no all schools should be virtual it's not safe for staff it's not safe for kids okay so the pressure in the bigger school districts milwaukee madison green bay are more apt to have an R with a model that we are not going to have in classes. And then you see the pressure on the schools of like Fond du Lac, Oshkosh, Appleton, definitely Green Bay, starting with Green Bay, to go from we'll do sort of a hybrid model, meaning some of the days kids will be in the school and some days they'll be out of school. Okay to more pressure on them now start to squeeze that down to less in class time to no in class time okay just telling you what's happening over the last several weeks and then they'll come back to the impact on you as it relates to all that because i got a feeling you're getting a few questions about that and the different leaves that apply and pieces to that okay so that's the dynamics that are going on. The other dynamics that are with that is the point that the legislature looks at, I don't know if you know this or not, but open enrollment means a student during some times of the year can go from, let's say Fond du Lac is gonna be closed, Rosendale is gonna be open, I'm just using names of places, I'm not, hope they are not. So I'd like my daughter to go from Fond du Lac to Rosendale. There are times of the year that people as a parent can make that choice. The difference is, is that the secondary district gets state aid for that move. <laughs> if that student goes to Fond du Lac, loses that money and the other district picks up that money. I only name schools not because of what they're doing just as examples. Okay, I wanna make that really clear. The legislature is really looking at that to say we got a lot of parents in Wisconsin that are impacted because of work, other reasons, lots of other reasons that we think kids ought to be in school. We may take the reins off and let districts, let parents decide where kids go to school. <laughs> Stand by for the politics of that as that's coming, but it could impact you over the next month as this debate's heating up. All right, all things just so you know what being talked about. That is separate from the issue of vouchers, which is a different political issue, not public school to public school transfers, that's less controversial. Public school to private school, much more controversial. Okay. Um, and whether that door is going to be open too. Most of the private schools, as you probably know, are really busy <laughs> because they're open. Okay. So and then they got the issue of whether that's safe, social distancing, all that stuff with that. Let's put that aside because that's not us. Let's come back to what well, is us. So you get the call to say, my school has decided that on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my daughter is in class, but Tuesdays and Thursdays, they're not. It's just an example. There's all kinds of these hybrids. Point is, there are some days they're in class and some days they're not in class. I want to work at home or I want leave to be at home because I have no child care for my son or daughter on the days they're required to be home. Are they eligible for work at home? And second, if you don't have work at home, are they eligible for either of the leaves under FERCRA, under the Families First Coronavirus Recovery Act? extended FMLA or the extended paid leave. What do you think? All right, and I told you I wouldn't make you raise your hand, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, but here's, here's how that's gonna work. The analysis so far, at least from the guidance that's available to us so far, is that if the parent has no choice, School's going to be closed Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they have no alternative child care. They will be eligible on those days, not the whole week necessarily, but on those days that they don't have the choice. 
So they may be eligible for the 12 weeks at the reduced amount for, for the, the child care piece. Again, having no alternative, okay. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm just saying what the law is, okay. And they might be available for the two weeks. If you know that if they've already used their 12 weeks of FMLA for whatever reason, then there is no leave available. It's a total of 12. The new law didn't add anything. It just added another category that people are eligible. Okay. If they use their 12, their two weeks, then they're done with that. But on those days, if the school offers an option to say you can either come to school under a hybrid model or you could do virtual, then they may not. It's only those scenarios where the parent has no option, at least from the guidance that we have so far, to suggest that they would be eligible for those leaves. And it also assumes that they're not exempt as an exemption as, as a healthcare provider, emergency responder, which I don't have a lot of in the private sector, but assuming they're not exempt under the law and they otherwise qualify, okay? If you're not getting that question, you're going to get that question because we're certainly getting that a lot every day right now over the last couple of weeks and that schools change within your particular area for your employees. That's going to be an issue. Any questions about that? Anybody get the, this one? You can raise your hand. Anybody get that question already? Deal with that yet? So okay. when they're like 400 hours are done, it's just an unpaid leave if they want to still continue to take off the it, 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 yeah, then it's up to your policies as okay. to what you would you would have, and that's assuming well, that's assuming they don't have other FMLA, right? Because that reason of childcare is a reason under both the extended FMLA. Mm -hmm. That's also the reason to get the two weeks. So it, it, it could, and again, it's the days; it's not week at a time scenario. So, yep. It's also going to expire in December. I was going to ask about that. Oh, I'm putting my money on that, huh? The only good news is they can't seem to agree on anything else right now. Maybe there won't be an agreement on that. I don't know. But I wouldn't just, I wouldn't, it's good. It's supposed to expire in the middle of a school term. <laughs> I, I, we'll see. I, I'm not a betting man, but I'm willing to bet we'll see an extension. I'd be really surprised. But as of right now, the laws, it's going to expire. Okay. All right, let's let's talk about something else that, that came out just a couple of weeks ago. As you may have seen that out in New York, one of the federal courts struck down four of the provisions under these lead aspects of things. The state of New York went into court and said, we think the interpretations from the Federal Department of Labor are inappropriate as it applies to this act and the federal court agreed with them. <laughs> okay, so these four things certainly, if that's correct, impact how you apply the leaves to your employees. So one has to do with healthcare providers that doesn't impact you a lot, but Another has to do with when I said there's a verification certification piece to show you don't have other alternatives that could be problematic according to that federal court in New York. So there was also an application of intermittent leave that came through the guidance that they said, oh, the Department of Labor's guidance on that's inappropriate and it kind of expands the use of intermittent leave, which is unusual because intermittent leave is pretty much up to you or supposed to be as, as an employer anyway under federal law, but here nor there, that could have a significant impact. And then again, the documentation employee provides they thought was too broad. And what they were saying from that federal court is the guidance put out from the Department of Labor interpreting these laws was too broad and is not appropriate. It definitely would impact how all the employers in New York apply these two laws. The reason I want you to know about it, if you don't know about it, is it's out there. It doesn't necessarily apply to us yet because what one federal court says in one part of the country may or may not apply to us and it doesn't just yet. That'll depend on what the federal government decides to do with this and then what the courts decide. Are we keeping track of it because it could have an impact on us? Absolutely. Do I want you to overreact and change your policies yet? No. 
okay, be careful. You don't necessarily have to do that yet. Why, well, like I said, I wanted to come in and tell you what's the latest, what's going on, where should the attendance be up so that you are ready and you know what it is if somebody comes in and says, what about this, you're on it, all right? And you are ahead of the game with this. This is certainly one of the most current things pending out there and we'll see what happens in the other courts, okay? Across the country. Face masks. For those of you that are tuning in virtually this morning, I can tell you that everybody else that's present in person here has a mask on but me. Am I violating the law? Am I violating the governor's order? I would never do that. <laughs> the reason is that if you're speaking at a presentation, that's a specific exemption to the governor's order. Now, who would think that a governor in Wisconsin, and, and I like the governor, and I represented him when he was the superintendent in OP, okay? I don't say that as a political statement, I'm just saying as a person. I think he's a, he's a nice man and a good person. But who would think that any governor in Wisconsin would also have an exemption, that if you're drinking in Wisconsin, you don't have to wear a mask. And somebody said to me, it's Wisconsin, for God's sakes, nobody ever has to wear a mask. I don't know if it's that broad in terms of the exception, but I gotta tell you the other thing is when we looked at the exceptions under the law, if you can't find an exception <laughs> under this particular mask ordinance, you're not trying. Because <laughs> in Wisconsin, we're either eating or we're drinking or we're talking. <laughs> and those are three of the big exceptions under the law. All right, that aside, that aside, let's talk practically in terms of some of the other aspects of it. So the employee comes in and says, I'm not wearing a mask. I got a medical condition. You can make me wear a mask. And the governor even said in the guidance that you can't ask for anything about that stuff. So there, I bet you none of you have gotten that, that suggestion, right? <laughs> well, the reality is the governor's order also says that this is an order, but other policies and other ordinances and other rules can be more restricted. And then you certainly within your employment setting have the right to pass policies and safety guidance. At a minimum under the general standard for OSHA, you get to pass safety health rules and regulations. And right now to have a rule about masks and safety for the protection of employees, customers, and others is absolutely supportive and reasonable under all of the circumstances, okay? And it can be broader than that. So even if the employee has an exception to what I got here in the governor's order, it doesn't matter. Your rule is going to, I was going to say trump that, but I'm not being political. Okay? You can override that. All right? You're going to get, I'm in a cubicle. And it, I don't know this. I don't know where it is. Also says in closed spaces. So I don't know what you got for a cubicle. You got a four, you know, you got a six foot wall. That's probably not in closed space. It's going to be a sense of reason. Certainly in all those settings, we're seeing a sense of reason. We're certainly seeing that if people are working in their offices, they're not having their masks. If they are going to the coffee room or the break room or other stuff, they're putting on their masks. Wherever there may be the scenarios with social distancing, it's just clearly it's a good idea within your policies to have all of those kind of things. Stay within the governor's order. You can be a little bit stricter than that. Can you discipline? Sure, but realistically, we're seeing common sense applying to those kind of things too. And most people are being supportive of that kind of stuff is what we're seeing so far. If I had the discipline case, the termination case because of mask, yes, I have. And talking about a little bit earlier, but a person knowingly had COVID, came into the workplace, refused any of the safety proceeding and some other people got COVID because of their poor, actions and intentional actions, quite frankly. Well, that's a unique, unfortunate case. The good news is, is nobody got seriously ill. They all recovered despite testing positive, but still was disciplinary. And in that case, termination, because it was so severe. Common sense, progressive discipline, 
keeping people safe overall. Most people get that, even if they don't like the mask stuff, even if they don't believe there's a pandemic and all of that kind of stuff. Most respect each other, and they'll do that out of respect. And that's all we're asking of folks at the end of the day. Whatever you believe or don't believe, at least respect each other. And let's have a safe environment. Just, just. Any questions or any issues or things that you anybody would add about the mass stuff that you're seeing within your workplaces? Anybody? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So an employee comes into one of the work settings and says, I'm not wearing a mask, and I know you've got a policy, and I know you can be restricted, but I have medical exemption. I even have a card. This is the example of a card the employee brought in. I'm exempt. Get out of my way. <laughs> Another similar card, <laughs> and I'm sorry, it was just the facts, <laughs> came in and said, I have a religious basis for not wearing a mask, and you're discriminating against me on the basis of my religion because of my mask. And he had another card similar to this, but had religious stuff on it. And does that give you a get out of jail free card? Because by God, they got a card. No, hell no, we can get these on the internet. Let's go on the internet. That's where this guy got his. Unfortunately, you didn't do enough research to know, you know, that little symbol with the federal agency? That's a protected symbol of the federal government. And they've got a different legal issue that has nothing to do with masks. <laughs> but they're on the receiving end of that problem because the government didn't think that was entertaining at all as far as that goes. You're going to get those kind of things. You're going to get the person that has the gun on the mask because it's a First Amendment right. <laughs> yes, we have rights, but they get balanced against other rights and things like that. And you're going to be upheld in regard to your policies and the other aspects of things that, that you have with all of that. I know some companies have offered face masks, shields, shields. instead of masks, they, if they have a medical issue or aren't comfortable with the mask, they let them use shields. Sure, let me repeat that. Let me repeat that just for, for the people that are listening. The question was, uh, their comment was, some companies have alternative shields and other things that might be an alternative for people that might have a medical scenario. I'm glad you mentioned that. First of all, the governor didn't think within the order that the shield would be sufficient, but there are certainly, depending on what are we talking about, that, that, that actually may be more protective in some of the scenarios and as an accommodation. I don't want to make light of it. I'm glad you said this because I should really follow up on the medical account. I don't want to make light of anybody's medical situations and we are going to get legitimate medical scenarios. I had that long before COVID. Big painting company I represent, for example, we had an applicant that couldn't wear the kind of mask that they all have to wear for painting, okay? And so we did the interactive process and what the different alternatives say, it doesn't mean you can paint without a mask, it just means what do we do, whether it's a shield or some alternative that we do so they can work and still not maybe do the kind of face covering that we were talking about. So there are a lot of alternatives. So we wanna use the interactive process. At the end of the day though, if it's the only medical scenarios, I can only work at home and you have no work at home, or the only medical accommodation that's, that's available is I cannot wear any kind of anything over my face. That may mean that they're not able to work at that particular time. Uh, another scenario to different painting scenario is I can't climb ladders. Well, if you're a, a firefighter or a painter and you get a medical system that says you can never climb a ladder, well, that's kind of, kind of a problem. <laughs> well, then we can't medically accommodate that. Again, I'm not making light of anybody's scenario. But it's interesting because I've had some doctors get real bold right out of the box. Only thing, there's no way this person could ever come to work in, in, until COVID's done. <laughs> you may have just walked your person out of a job by saying something. Don't say that, doctor. So we're going to have the interactive process. We're not looking to fire anybody. <laughs> it's hard to recruit. It's hard to, to keep people. But at the same time, don't do that. And we had a doctor, it was, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. We had the interactive process, the person got a lot better. We were able to come up with, a, come up with an accommodation and it all worked out. So, anyway, let's leave a little time for a couple of minutes anyway for some questions of anything anybody else has or observations, anything. And I don't know if we're getting any uh, virtual from uh, people tuning in on that.
anything else anybody else wants to bring up ask uh, as far as that goes things going on in the workplace interesting times to say the least i'm curious if um, a company can like what's going to happen to a company that doesn't enforce the face mask sure uh, as we've approached all of the reopening scenarios and you, you you know you're all great pressure to reopen but to reopen safely it's a negligence standard you know and it's what what's your duty of care and and what things are we putting in place to address that duty of care so if we have customers come into our workplace and notice you know for those of you that, that are out about shopping how the business the retail business has changed over the last three months <laughs> Sometimes you could walk right in, it's getting tighter and tighter. It's a duty of care. And if there's a case, there is a case with Walmart already where somebody got COVID and died. And there's a case that Walmart didn't honor its obligations of duty of care under negligence standard. That'll take years to work itself through the courts. But the analysis will be what all those safety procedures you're doing, all those rules you put in place, all get weighed under the negligence standard to say, were you reasonable in putting a plan in place? And you want to do it anyway. I'm not just saying you do it because of the negligence standard and the lawsuit piece. You want to do it because we want to be safe and we want to take care of our people and we want to take care of our customers. But from the legal sense, it's the negligence standard. So everything you put in place, everything you can think of, all the training you do with your employees are really critical to help under the negligence standard of you took care, okay? Do you have training? Do you have a process in place to say, if we get a COVID case in our workplace, here's what our response, here's who our response team is, and here's how they're trained, and here's how we're going to deal with it. Who talks to that employee? Who deals with where that employee has been? Who deals with the stuff that they've touched or is responsible for cleaning that workplace? Wouldn't it be nice? Doesn't it look a lot better for you, but it's also better in protecting people to have people specially trained to, to if we have an issue in the workplace, here's what it's gonna be, here's who it's gonna be. They're trained to deal with it so we don't have any other spread, okay? Consider it if you don't. I'm not saying you have to. The more of those things you put in place all help you in regards to reopening and, and the standard of care. And it also reduces your chances of spreading cases in the first place. And it makes your employees more comfortable. That is a great point. The point was it makes employees more comfortable. One of, isn't one of the toughest issues of transitioning back to reopening and people being scared, legitimately nervous about this. And the more that you can reinforce the training and show all the safety, I'm back to the comment discussed earlier is there are a lot of places it's more safe at work because of all the stuff you've done than in some of the other settings. We have the cases of people getting COVID at home and they would have been better at work quite frankly. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a really important point. How are we doing? Are we okay, Joe? Any other comments, questions? <laughs> okay, like that. I also respect your time. I always try to stay right on time as we can as you get busy schedules and busy things going on. Anything else before we wrap up? Well, then let me wrap up by saying this. It's the way I start. There isn't the time like this. <laughs> the 30 plus some odd years I've been doing this. But that's okay. It's a great challenge and it's a challenge that each one of you, as you're gonna look back in a couple of years that you should feel good about, you should feel proud about of the impact that you had on people's lives, on, on the economy, on your business, that we're making as best of decisions we can under, under tough times. And I think we're all gonna feel pretty good about that. Give us a couple months, ideally we get, you know, vaccine and other aspects and we look back on it and evaluate. Sooner couldn't be better than later. Mm -hmm. We will, we'll get there. In the meantime, thanks to all of you for the day-to-day -day stuff you're doing. I get to see it every day, and I feel pretty good about what I see. Okay, thanks for inviting me in. It's really my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.